<laughs> hey, everybody stay standing. I got to say, I am just so privileged to be a part of this amazing conference. You know, uh, I was on the phone with Lisa uh, right before I, I came tonight's service, and she said, John, I, I believe Lee Cummings is one of the smartest men I've ever met. He is a brilliant strategist, and uh, I'm just so thankful that you're here. Last year when I was here with Bethel, you weren't here, and I was so sad that you weren't here. So I was so excited that you and Jane were going to be here tonight. And Lisa and I, we just love and we value what you've done for the body of Christ. You are amazing leaders, and we are just so thankful for your friendship and what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. And oh my gosh, what amazing worship tonight. Wow. I, I was over here just having so much fun worshiping, and I don't cry a lot of times before I preach because I'm so focused, but I'm sorry. There were just tears in my eyes. I love Corey and Annie and Anna Asbury, wherever they are. I love you guys. They are friends. They've been friends of Lisa's and I for years. So I, 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 when, I, when I got here, I texted Corey, and I said, Corey, are you leaving tonight? Please tell me you're leaving tonight. And he said, yes, yes. I said, all right. That's so good. But anyway, I, I'm so glad to be here. Look, a lot of you guys don't know this, but I'm a Michigander. Come on. <laughs> From the age of three to 15, I was raised in Whitehall, Michigan. You probably don't even know where it is. We have, yeah, you do, some of you. We, we, we have 2,800 people, and we are not a suburb. <laughs> so we are just a dinky, dinky little town, and um, I just love Michigan, and I always love coming back because Michigan people are just some of the coolest people in the United States. Trust me, I've been all over the United States. You guys are it, man. I'm so glad to be with you tonight. So listen, I'm family. Don't look at me as a stranger. Don't look at me as a guest, okay? So you got Papa Lee, Mama Jane, Uncle John is in the house, right? Come on. <laughs> anyway, listen, um, I, I, just, um, I just have something so burning in my heart for you tonight. And I really believe it's a prophetic word. Um, it's out of a new book that I've written. And I am just, I am believing God that tonight is gonna be a night that all of us are changed forever not only from the worship, which I've already been changed because of the worship, but because of the word. And before I, I, I pray and get into the word, I want to do something. I know some of you, a lot of you probably here don't know me, and some of you do know me. Well, the best way you can get to know me is the people that I love so deeply and dearly is my family introducing them to you. And for those of you that do know me, well, I just want to catch you up. We've been busy. We've had two weddings in the last seven months. So let me show up. Oh, there they are. Oh my gosh. That is my amazing, amazing, gorgeous, best friend, wife of 37 years of marriage. I told Lisa a few months ago, I said, baby, if you were single, I'd be so on your trail. So <laughs> And we have four sons, and um, over on the left is our oldest son. That's his wife, Juliana. They've been married 10 years, and you see those four little ones? Those are my G-babies. You say, what in the world is a G-baby? I'm way too young to be grandpa. So it's G-daddy and G for short. And then Arden, Arden is our baby. He got married to Christian. Christian is an, SC, uh, she is an Auburn girl. And she is now on our team. And she is amazing direct to camera. So you'll see a, her a lot on Messenger News. And then uh, my mom sneaked in there. She's 92 years old and sharp as a tack. I'll tell you what. I could tell you stories after stories about my mom. She's hilarious. Next to my mom is the only left available. Bevere boy. Come on, I need a Michigander daughter-in-law. Come on. <laughs> you know what to do, all right? You just Facebook, Twitter, all that, you know, Instagram. Y'all can laugh tonight, can you? Right? Okay, all right. And then Austin and Jess, Austin's our second born. He got married to a Pac-10 girl. And so she's from Seattle. And, you know, Arden and, and Austin got uh, engaged four days apart. And they both looked at us, and Bevere's don't believe in long engagements, including me. And they said, we want to get married right away this fall. And we we're like, your mom and I are scheduled all over the world. We are gone so much this fall. You can't. They said, we will. So Arden and Jess got married on a Monday night in Seattle. That's the first Monday night wedding I think I've ever been to. And Arden and Christian took our only weekend off that Lisa and I were going to spend together. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. So that's my family. And you know, the more I've loved my family, the more I realize how much God loves us because we're his big family. Can you say Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. Do you want a message from me tonight or do you want your life changed forever? Which one? Life changed forever. That's a good response. You know, I could be the greatest communicator on the planet, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't touch these words, you're just getting information. 
And I'm, I'm not coming all the way here today on these flights to give you information. I want to see transformation. And by the way, I got to say, it is so good to be here with my friend uh, uh, David Perkins and my friend Les Peach Camp. Where are you guys? You, you somewhere? Aren't they amazing men of God? Is that Brandon? Is that Brandon? And Brandon Cormier. I didn't know you were here. Anyway, it's just, I feel like this is a big family reunion tonight. This is so cool. But anyway, um, if you really believe, and I want you to be honest, you really believe the Holy Spirit can change you forever, put, put up your hand if you really believe that. Okay, now put up your other hand because the Bible says we don't have because we don't ask, right? So let's believe God. Father, in the name of Jesus, what an amazing conference this has been. Holy Spirit, you've done so much in our midst, and I'm asking that you would continue. I'm asking that you would do what you love to do the most, reveal Jesus to us in a way like we'd never, ever known him before. I'm asking that you would invade this sanctuary tonight, that, Lord, as you do this for us, that it will be a night that will never, ever be the same again. We're asking this in the name of Jesus, that we would go from glory to glory and faith to faith, and I'm asking that it would be done in here on earth as it is in heaven. And for this, we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise and all the thanksgiving. And it's in the mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody that agrees shouts. Come on, in advance, give him praise for what he's gonna do tonight. Amen. Amen, you can be seated. Watch this. You want to know how gold is purified? It's ground down, beat down, then it's thrown into a furnace, melted down by a 2,000 degree fire. The heat increases, impurities begin to surface, things you never saw before, they appear. You scrape away these impurities and what are you left with? Refined, pure gold. The trials you face as a human being are the furnace. Designed to remove the impurities in us so the only thing that remains is what was placed at the core of us, God's nature and character. Some of you are in the furnace right now. All you see is the fire. All you feel is the heat. Each day feels like a struggle and you want to give up. You want to hit the snooze button. You want to give up on that marriage. You want to quit that job. Take the easy way out. But you weren't created for easy. You were created for victory. When the fires of life are raging, keep going. And always remember, on the other side of pain, on the other side of trial, is your promise. So I want to open up tonight and uh, give you a little background. Um, I was actually raised in church. My parents took me to church every single weekend, every Sunday. And, but yet I had absolutely no relationship with God whatsoever. And it was quite obvious. I mean, when I was in high school, people were witnessing to me like crazy. When I went to college, they were witnessing to me. One guy, he actually came to my room and shared with me for two hours. And after I got saved, he told me, he said, John, when I left your room, after two hours of sharing with you about Jesus, I left your room in tears because you weren't even connecting. But it wasn't until my sophomore year, and athletics is a huge part of my background. I played varsity tennis at Purdue University. Uh, the only reason I didn't go to U of M or State was because I knew I couldn't start for their teams, but I knew I could start for Purdue. So, and I, it was a good choice because I met Lisa and I got saved there, right? But anyway, um, one of the best athletes in the state of Indiana was in our fraternity. And I remember the night he came up my sophomore year and began to share Jesus with me. I remember he's sharing with me, and all of a sudden, I, the realization hits me that the one who created the heavens and the earth really wanted to reveal himself to me personally. I mean, that blew my mind. I mean, that he actually cared for me deeply, that he loved me uniquely, that he would actually make promises to me as a father would to a son or a daughter and actually fulfill them, that he actually had crafted a plan for my life. And I, I remember in that fraternity, I gave Jesus my life and he became the Lord, the, the Lord of my life. And, and what stood out to me above everything was his presence. And let me explain something it's very important for you to understand. The Bible talks about two types of the presence of God. There is the omnipresence of God. There is the manifest presence of God. The omnipresence of God is he's always there. I mean, David says, where can I make uh, my bed? If I, make, if I live in the highest mountain, you're there. If I make my bed in the lowest valley, you're there. That's the presence of the Lord that says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The other 
presence of God that is so real to the Christian life is called the manifest presence of God. That is when God reveals himself to your mind, your will, your senses, your emotions. That's a very real part of Christianity. Jesus said, I will manifest myself to you and not to the world, right? Well, that was what was overwhelming to me was the presence of God. I mean, I am not the crying type and I would be in services just weeping because the presence of God was so overwhelming. I remember one time I was watching actually a form, a, a, a storm form in the distance. And all of a sudden I was overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I realized the one who created this entire universe was now my dad. And it just, it just was blowing me away. And, and, and he was answering my prayers so quickly and so uniquely. And I, I'll, I'll never forget the time, you know, my cassette player broke. Just Google it later, it's prehistoric. <laughs> anyway, um, my cassette player broke in my car and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't worship. I can't listen to teaching. What am I gonna do? And I thought, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. So I put my hands on that. I said, you're sick, I'm, I'm laying hands on you. And do you know, I prayed and I put the cassette in there and it worked and it never broke again. I mean, I mean, and I'm like, okay, this is Christianity, right? But then after a few years, the presence of God started seeming a little more elusive and he wasn't answering prayers as uniquely and quickly as he was. And questions just started arising like, God, why does it seem like the promises aren't coming to pass that you're making to me so quickly in my life? In fact, why does it seem like I'm going backward from them? In fact, can I go one step further? Why does it seem like nothing is going right in my life? And the overarching question was this, God, where are you? Now, has anybody ever thought that or asked that? Can I see a show of hands or am I preaching way over your head right now? Okay, so you know where I'm talking about, right? So there was a there was a process that I didn't understand. And that is this, that God has a three-step pathway to get every single one of us to our destiny. How many of you know you have a destiny in God? Come on, I mean, David says in Psalm 139 that every day of our life was written in a book before a single day began. I mean, that's mind blowing right there, right? Our steps are ordered of the Lord, the Bible tells us. And there's not only major destinies, there's what I like to call subplots, sub destinies, right? I mean, there's the major, major one and there's the sub ones, right? Well, God, in order to get us to that destiny that he's sending us to, what he begins with is he shows us a glimpse of where we're going and he makes promises to us. With Jeremiah, you're gonna be a prophet to the nations. With Joseph, it's a dream. With David, it's the prophet in the land coming and saying, you're gonna be a king one day, right? And I could go on and on. I know I actually have a file in my desk drawer that has the prophetic words that have been given to me in the last 40 years of my Christian walk. And can I, can I say this? It, it's not a very thick folder because there's been a lot of words given to me, but I only put the ones in there that I really know heaven breathed on. But there's actually a sheet of paper with a word that is, delayed, is dated July 1981. And you know, there are things that God told me I would do in July, 1981. Are you tracking with me right now? That I didn't start doing until I was in my 50s, until this decade. Now, somebody's probably sitting there going, but whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, I, I haven't had any glimpses. I haven't had any promises. Well. Can I, can I just be really honest with you right now? My Bible says that God rewards those who diligently seek him in faith. My Bible does not say God rewards those who casually seek him in wonder and doubt. You might wanna check up on your seeking level. I mean, just, 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 just a little check up there. You, you understand what I'm saying? It'll get better in a minute, okay? So once he gives the glimpse, the promise, then the process begins. Now, what's the process? I've affectionately termed this process stage as the wilderness or refinement. Now, why is the process so important? Because in the process, God develops in us the character that is needed for the promise. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, once we successfully navigate the process, then the promotion comes. That's the third step, and that is the promise fulfilled. Peter writes about this when he makes this statement in 1 Peter chapter one. And the first five verses, Peter talks about heaven. 
And do you know, one of the favorite things I love to talk about is heaven. I mean, so did the apostles, but I, I love what these guys did. They realized, hey, we live in the here and the now. Let's just mention heaven, but let's really focus in on the here and now, right? And all good ministers, we, we do that, right? Are, are you following me? And so Peter talks about heaven in the first five verses, but then he says, in this you greatly rejoice in your inheritance in heaven that is uncorruptible. But then he says, though now, so here goes the here and now, for a little while, everybody shout little while. Yeah. Now, now you know, a little while to God is a little different than a little while to us. You know, you look at your friend and you say, I'm gonna be in your house in a little while. What do you mean? You're gonna be over there in 15 minutes, right? But I started thinking about this one day and I thought, well, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So I started thinking, well, then what's an hour to God? And I divided a thousand years by 24 and I got 42.6 years. So 15 minutes is seven or eight years. Yeah, you're so glad you came and heard that tonight, aren't you? <laughs> For a little while, now look at this, if need be, and let me help you, the need is there. You have been grieved and the word grieved means greatly distressed by various trials. Now, I love this next verse, look at this. These trials show that your faith is genuine. So when you successfully navigate trials, hey, you know what, smile. When you're in the middle of a trial, smile. Cause you know what that means? You don't have counterfeit faith. You actually got real faith. That's good news, right? I hope. <clears throat> it is being tested, everybody say tested. As fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So around that time period that I talked to you about where the presence of God started getting elusive, um, I was working for a church in Dallas, Texas. We were probably the best known church in the United States. We had 450 paid staff members, okay? And um, our church, we didn't talk a lot about character, about holiness. And we, we, we talked a lot about faith, receiving from God, the promises of God, and so I'm out praying one night and we had this field, Lisa and I, right by the, the apartment that we were living in and, and the field was usually, nobody was there at night or in the morning early. And I was on, out in that field late at night and the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly, just like I'm speaking to you right now. And I'll never forget, he said, son, I'm gonna begin to teach you how to deny yourself, how to take up your cross and how to follow me. I'm gonna begin to do a work of holiness in your life. Now, I was so excited that I literally left the field immediately, ran back to the apartment. Lisa's taking off her makeup, getting ready for bed. I said, babe, babe, God spoke to me. He's gonna to begin to do a work of holiness in my life. I said, he's gonna make me a holy man. All these, all these excesses in my life, you know, cause I, I watched so much sports on TV and I ate so much food. I mean, food was an idol. I ate when I wasn't even hungry. I mean, I ate when I was happy. I ate when I was sad. I ate when I was excited. I ate when I, I, just, I just ate. And I, I, I said, all, all the excesses in my life are just gonna go away. So you know what happened the next three months? I ate twice as much as what I normally ate. I watched twice as much TV, twice as much sports. And so after three months of this, I walked back out that same field. This time it was early in the morning. I said, hey God, I don't get this. Um, you said you were gonna do this work of holiness in my life. And I said, Lord, I'm twice as fleshly as I was three months ago. And, and the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, son, that's because you've been doing it your way. He said, holiness is not a work of your flesh. It is a product of my grace. He said, now I'm gonna begin to do it my way. Now I had no idea what he was saying, but over the next six months after that, I started going through trials like I had never experience before. I mean, trials so intense. Now, and let me make this really clear. How many of you know there are self-inflicted trials? You know what I mean? You do stupid things to bring trials on yourself, right? Then there's trials you go through where you didn't do anything. These are the kind of trials I'm going through, okay? And they're so intense that there's a statement that the prophet Jeremiah makes in Jeremiah 15. And you know what the statement, he, you know what he says? He says, why is my pain perpetual? I, I'm gonna tell you, I, I woke up in pain. I ate breakfast in pain. I went to work at the church in pain. I ate lunch in pain. I worked that afternoon in pain. I came home in pain. I ate dinner in pain. I went to bed that night in pain. I woke up the next morning in pain. It was perpetual. And in the midst of these trials, the six month time period, I am like a terror to live with. 
I mean, I'm yelling at Lisa for the stupidest things. I have no patience for her. I am, I'm irritated by my nine month old son. I'm upset with my friends because they're avoiding me. I wonder why. The people I'm working with, I'm really ticked off at because they don't, they don't, they don't have compassion for what I'm going through. I'm really upset with my pastor because he's not saying anything to me. I'm mad at everybody. And I remember it got really bad. And I, I went back out to that field early in the morning, like this is six months later. And I said, God, why am I so angry? Why am I so bitter? I, I, I wasn't even this angry before I got saved. I don't ever remember being this angry. What do I bind? What do I cast out? And the Lord showed me right there. He said, son, you don't cast out flesh. You crucify it. And so you have to understand, I have an engineering degree from Purdue University. So God, a lot of times will speak to me, you know, scientifically. You, you understand what I'm saying? So he said, son, look at your ring on your finger. And this is a, a new ring that Lisa gave us at 25. But at that time, I had a 14 karat gold ring. Do you know what 14 karat gold is? 14 parts out of 24 parts is gold. 10 parts out of 24 parts is other metals such as copper, zinc, nickel, etc. right? So God says, look at your gold ring. I said, yeah, yeah, I see my gold ring. He said, um, looks like pure gold, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it looks like pure gold. He said, what happens if you put it in a furnace and heat it up a couple thousand degrees? I said, well, it liquefies. He said, then what happens? I said, well, the impurities, which are the lighter metals, the copper, zinc, neck, nickel, et cetera, because they're lighter metals than gold, they begin to come to the surface. He said, they appear, right? I said, yeah, they appear. <laughs> he said, you couldn't see them before you put the ring in the furnace, could you? I said, no, you couldn't see them before you put the ring in the furnace. He said, son, you keep asking me where all this anger, bitterness is coming from. He said, it's always been in there. He said, it wasn't visible to you, but I knew it was there. He said, so I've allowed you to come into this furnace of affliction to expose these things. He said, now what you do with them will determine your future. He said, if you keep blaming your pastor, your friends, the people you work with, he said, it's just gonna go all right back down and we're gonna have to start this process all over again. Or he said, oh, or you can own it. And he said, if you own it and repent of it and quit putting the blame on everybody else, he said, I'll take my ladle and skin these things right out of your life. I remember during this time, I'm in the office, at, 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 in my office at church, and I actually had my own office, and I remember closing the door, and I literally just, I was hurting so bad, I just put my head up against the corner walls, and I said, God, why do I hurt so bad inside? And God said, because you're dying. And he said, there's always pain in death. He said, do you wanna know how you're gonna know when you're dead? I said, yes, please tell me, how will I know when I'm dead? He said, you won't hurt anymore, dead people don't have pain. I said, God, would you please kill me quick? So you have to understand, God spoke to my heart and said, son, you're gonna preach the gospel all over the world. You're gonna preach it to nations. And it was 1985 and Jesus was coming in 1988 and I only had three years left. <laughs> and so I thought I was ready. I'm like, God, I have got to go now, right? Not, not go through these stupid trials. But you see, God knew that it would have been a disaster if he would have allowed me to do what he had called me to do at that time. It kind of reminds me of like Joseph. You know Joseph in the Bible? Does anybody know who I'm talking about? He's Abraham's great grandson. And he, if you don't know about him, read Genesis 37 through 50. Really, it'd be a good thing to read tonight before you go to bed. But you know, when jo you know, Joseph, God gives him these dreams, these two dreams that he is going to be a, a leader and that actually his brothers would be under his leadership, right? But when Joseph shows up in Genesis 37, in the very first verse that it's written about him, you know what it says? He was telling his father the bad things his brothers were doing. So, you know, we got, we got a tattletale, okay? Um, if you go just a few verses later, he is bragging to his brothers about, man, I am the favored son and I got the dreams of leadership and y'all are gonna be under my authority. So he's a bragger. And he's speaking down to his brothers. So can we list this? When Joseph shows up, we got a tattletale, a bragger, and somebody who speaks down to people. If God puts him into that position of leadership right then, you're gonna have a very narcissistic, insecure leader. So God says, okay, you need a little refining here, Joseph. Now, God does not author this. 
He knows the end from the beginning. You, you gotta remember, we are bound. We're in this body, we are bound to time. I can tell you everything that happened this weekend, this past weekend, but I can't tell you anything about tomorrow because I'm bound to time, right? But God is outside of time and God knows the end from the beginning. So God knows these brothers. He says, I'm gonna use what these brothers are gonna do for a little refining, right? So y'all know the story, the brothers, you know, they throw them into the pit, which for those of you who don't know, pit is an acronym for preachers in training. <laughs> and then he's sold as a slave to a foreign nation, Egypt, and he now becomes a slave and one of the officers of the king of Egypt's house, a guy named Potiphar. So I'm sure Joseph is thinking in the first few months, I'm gonna, my, my dad is gonna rescue me, but there's no rescue from a father. But here's the deal. We read the story and as a Westerners, we don't connect with it. And the reason we don't connect is because we don't understand what those brothers really did. In essence, what those brothers did to Joseph was worse than killing him. See, because everything, everything depended back in those days of receiving your father's name and inheritance. It was so important. Because when you're a slave in a foreign nation back in those days, you will be a slave the rest of your life. Your wife will be a slave all of her life. Your children will be slaves all of their lives. Their children will be slaves. And all your family will ever work for is somebody else's heritage. You will never have your own heritage. Now, it's one thing to be born a slave. It is a totally, completely different thing to be born the heir of a very wealthy man and have it stripped away from you by your own brothers. Joseph is like a living dead man. 10 years, would you stop and think about it? Would you go back 10 years? Some of you, that's half your age. Now everything's going good because God always blesses his kids. But underneath the surface, something much worse is going on because the master Wife gets the hots for Joseph. And this is amazing to me. She doesn't approach him once or twice. She approaches him every day. Now, I'm sure this woman's gorgeous because she is the wife of one of the officers of the king. She's scented in the best. She's dressed in the best and probably has a seducing spirit up to her eyeballs. But every single day, he resists. And what's really amazing to me is he didn't have a connect group. <laughs> he didn't have a Lee Cummings bringing the word of God to him every single Sunday. But he resists, he resists. And you know, something that I love is the apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church and made a statement. But when most of us read this statement and I did for years, we read it as Paul saying it to the Philippians, but in reality, it's really God saying this to us. So look at these words. Paul says, as, as you have always obeyed in my presence, even so much more now obey in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, we don't get what the fear of God is. The fear of God is not to be scared of God. It's to be terrified to be away from him. The fear of the Lord is to be terrified, not afraid, terrified to be away from God. Joseph's got this. See, it's really easy to obey God when you're in the midst of this kind of worship. When Corey and the team are leading us in worship, oh my gosh, I'll do anything for you, Jesus. But what about, what about Thursday night when your kid's throwing up all night long and you got the presentation of your life at the office at 8 a.m. in front of the board? What about someone gossips about you, tells a total lie, and the authorities at your company believe it, and you lose your dream, dream job, and you didn't do a thing wrong? Are you still going to obey God? Because I'm going to tell you, there's this little thing that I like to call being passive aggressive. Do you know what passive aggressive is? It means you get at somebody another way. And it's kind of like, okay, God, how could I lose this job? And all of a sudden now you go on a drinking binge because you're really mad at God. 
I know nobody can relate to this. Only, I'm the only one that's ever done that. So I know I'm way over your head right now. But people actually, some people in other places actually do that. But Joseph, Joseph doesn't do this. He just keeps resisting. Think about it. You've gone 10 years. You've lost everything because of your brothers. They're the ones that are wicked in your eyes. You're the, ones that, you're the one that was godly. And 10 years now, you're a slave. And there's no hope of a father's rescue anymore. So now the stage is set. They're alone in the house. She comes to him, and I can only imagine she's prepared for this. She's got a little cleavage showing, a lot of cleavage showing. She's got her leg outside one slit of that dress that she chose just right. And she comes and nestles up in close to him. And she goes, I'm all yours. Nobody's here. Nobody will ever know. And I love what this young man does. He flees sexual immorality. She's got a hold of him. That garment rips. He runs out of the house stark naked. She's a scorned woman and her scorn turns in, well, her hate, her, her lust turns into hatred. Now she blames him for the very thing he ran from. When you are a slave in a foreign nation and you have raped, tried to rape the officer of the king's wife, they throw you in the dungeon. And that's exactly where he was put. Now, here's a problem. Seven months ago, I preached in a prison called Angola. It's the largest prison in the United States. It's in South Louisiana. 6,200 inmates. Every one of them are in there from 20 years to life, no parole. Can I tell you, that prison was a country club compared to a Middle Eastern dungeon. I have been in a few Middle Eastern dungeons. They are usually hewned out cisterns. In other words, they used to hold water. They're dry, but they're still very damp. They're underground. And the average cistern is about four feet tall. So you can't even stand in it. Okay. Now you don't get a mattress like they did in Angola. You sleep on bedrock that's damp. You have no pillow. You don't have a toilet or a sink. So that means you live in your waist. The Bible says they hurt his feet with fetters and laid him in chains until the time that his word, and that word his word means the prophetic promise that God made to him came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Then they give you what's known as the bread of affliction. You'll find it in 1 Kings 17. What is the bread of affliction? Dying is too easy. So what they want is they want you to live. So they give you just enough bread and just enough water to keep you alive so you can suffer. And they just hope you'll get a disease or something like that so you can suffer even more because you don't get doctors like our prisoners do. That's where Joseph is. They've hurt his feet with fetters. Now, stop and think about this with me. All he's done is obeyed God. All he did was proclaim the dream that God gave to him. And that got him the pit and slavery. Then he does exactly what the word of God says. He flees sexual immorality and that gets him the dungeon. So every time he obeys God, his life conditions get worse. Now you're a foreign slave, you've, ra- you've been accused of raping the king's wife. They are leaving you in there to rot. And then God, listen to me, God then brings the greatest test to Joseph. You know what the greatest test is? He brings two men who had dreams the night before, a butler and a baker. What's the test? The test is this, can Joseph proclaim to these two men the faithfulness of God when he hasn't seen a shred of evidence in his own life in 10 years in regard to his personal promise. Think about it, God says you're gonna be a leader and your brothers will be under your authority, but he's gone from pit to slavery to dungeon. If Joseph would have been like a lot of us, he would have looked at those two guys and said, you had a dream last night? I had a dream once, leave me alone. Dreams don't come true. If he would have done that, he would have died in the dungeon, 
saying God is unfaithful, he doesn't keep his promises. But the fact is, God is faithful and he does keep his promises. He proclaims the faithfulness of God to them. The butler is promoted, but he forgets about him. So he's two more years in that hell hole. Two more years. Are you tracking with me? And all the guy's done is obey God. See, we base our success on immediate, on immediate results. Well, I guess I must not be obeying. I guess God doesn't care if I get drunk. If Joseph did that, he never would have proclaimed the faithfulness of God to that butler and baker. But you know what the Bible says? That Joseph remembered the dream. You know that word remember? You know how we use the word remember? Oh, I just remembered, man, I got an appointment. No, that's not what that word means. The word remembered means the entire time he kept it right before him. He kept it right before him. Two years later, the king's got a dream. The butler goes, oh my gosh, I forgot about that guy. In one day, one day, Joseph is elevated number two man in all Egypt and really number two man in the planet because Egypt was the number one country in the world. There's seven years, seven more years of plenty and there's two more years of famine. And here come his brothers. Add up the years, it's 19 years. And some of us are upset if our dream doesn't come pass in one year. 19 years later. Do you know what Joseph's life shows us? Listen to me, listen, listen. No man, no woman, no child, no organization, no boss, no demon can ever get you out of the will and the destiny of God for your life. Joseph's brother said, we are gonna kill him and destroy this dream and see if that dream ever comes to pass. God says, oh yeah, you think you're gonna do that? You're actually the instruments I'm gonna use to fulfill his dream. The only one that can get you out of your destiny, let's point your finger right here, is you. You know, Israel was only meant to go through one year of refining. If you read your Bibles, Exodus, very carefully in, in Numbers, you'll find out God only intended to be there one year. But they had a problem. Okay? And it was called, you know, can, can I just, can, 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 I, can I take a pause here for a second? Okay? Just give me a second here, okay? 1 Corinthians 10 says that Israel is an example to us. Right? And it says, can, can you imagine being a pastor? And having three million people in your congregation and only two adults in your entire congregation fulfill their destiny. That's Moses. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 10 says, they're an example to us, to us that live in the last days, right? And it says there's five things they did to keep them out of their destiny, right? Five things. And so they li Paul lists these five things. And it's like sexual immorality, adultery, idolatry, tempting Christ. And then there's this funny one. You know, when I was a kid, my little sister used to watch Sesame Street and they had this little song they sang, one of these things just doesn't belong here. You know, they got a horse, they got a elephant, they got a car, and then they got an alligator. You know, it's the alligator. You don't ride on alligators. You ride on the other ones, right? <laughs> and I wanted to sing that song every time I read that chapter. Because the fifth one was complaining. And I'm like, what? How can you put complaining in a list with idolatry, tempting Christ, and, I, you know, sexual immorality? And boy, I'll never forget the day. I, I mean, I was, I was a little upset. I'm like, this is out of place. And the Holy Spirit said to me, now listen, he said, complaining is a serious sin. I said, okay, why? I need the why, why? He said, because complaining is an affront to my character. Because complaining says to me, 
God, I don't like what you're doing in my life. And if I were you, I'd do this differently. He said, it's a lack of the fear of the Lord. See, Malachi, everybody say Malachi. Malachi. Do you know Malachi, even though he's an Old Testament prophet, he didn't prophesy about Old Testament times. He prophesied about the time of Jesus and our day. The day of his first coming and the day of his second coming. Do you know what, Ma- do you know what Malachi said? Right before Jesus returns, there's gonna be three, human class, three groups of human beings on the earth, three. Two are gonna be Christians, right? The first group are believers who complain. You got it? The second group are believers who fear God. And the third group are gonna be the unbelievers. Because God makes the same, he says, your words are really hard against me. And they say, what have we said against you? Go to it, Tim, I, I'm sorry. L- l- go to the next one. He, he, here's what they, they're saying. Go ahead, go to the next one. When, these, these are the words that God says you've been speaking against me. When you complainers said, it doesn't pay to serve God. What do we ever get out of it? When we did what he said, what difference did it make? In other words, I'm going through all these. See, you, you'll find out Jesus is going to come to his church first as a refiner's fire. They're going through all these refining. And they're saying, God, what, what, what good is it I'm obeying you? So they, they have a totally different attitude than Joseph. Are, are you tracking with me? Are, 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 you, are you here? Okay. Now look at this. C- click it. From now on, we will call the arrogant. Now that's the unbelievers. We'll call them blessed. This is what these people are saying. For those who do evil, they get rich. Hey, I'm going through these trials. And those who dare God to punish them, they don't suffer any harm. Are you seeing this? But then to watch this. Then those whose lives honor God, that's the fear of the Lord. Those people like Jane Cummings, right? Watch this. They got together and talked it over. They're going through the same trials. God saw what they were doing and listened in. A book was opened in God's presence and minutes were taken to the meeting with the names of the God fearers written down. Keep going. God says, they're mine, all mine. They'll get special treatment. Sure is quiet right now. When I go into action, I treat them with the same consideration and kind, kindness that parents give a child who honors them. Now look at this. Once more, in other words, you couldn't tell before. Once more, you will be able to see the difference between the righteous and the wicked. In other words, the wicked look so blessed. The righteous are going through all this refining between those who serve God and those who don't. When God dealt with me about this complaining stuff, I literally put a watch on my mouth and I said, okay, I'm not complaining. And I remember Lisa and I got down, we sat down, we said, we're gonna discipline our sons for rebellion if they complain. Now there's some people thought we were extreme, but all four of our sons work for our ministry. So maybe it was the wisdom of God. Children is justified by, their children, by your wisdom, right? But anyway, um, but here's the deal. I remember I was on a four-day fast. And I remember waking up, I think it was the third or fourth day. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I hear the complaining in your heart. <laughs> I didn't get out of, I did not get out of bed that morning. I literally rolled to my knees and I repented big time. Because I felt abandoned. I felt like, God, why aren't you moving? I'm your boy. <laughs> I preach your word. I, I, I serve you. I get on all these airplanes. <laughs> How come? I know what they're doing and they're blessed. And God goes, I hear the complaining in your heart. Because I felt abandoned. I know nobody can relate to this tonight. I'm so sorry to bring you a message that's way over our heads. But, you know, I just, I'm using myself. I'm helping me tonight, okay? You're just sitting in my counseling appointment right now. He felt abandoned. I'm sure Joseph felt abandoned. Don't you think? Watch this video. And by the way, you'll recognize the music and one of my favorite praise leaders. Everybody has a hero. Okay. Mine's my dad. Yes, I get it. Since mom died, it's only been us. He has a way of filling my life with color. Dad, which one? That one. Sometimes I don't understand his advice. 
but I trust him. And what always brought us together was our love for running. One day, I'll be faster than him. And when I am, I'm gonna win every marathon in the world. Abby? What's wrong, champ? Or at least that was my plan. I'm losing my sight. And real quick, read to me the lowest level that you can see on there. What is called is interocular melanoma. Eye cancer. Unfortunately, you will lose your vision. That was the day my father disappeared. Okay. Come on. Dad! Wakey, wakey. Ready to run, champ? Come on. I thought he would always be there for me. I guess I was wrong. Dad, where are you? You abandoned me. Where are you, Dad? Where did you go? Do you not love me anymore? Am I still beautiful? Are you no longer proud of me? How could you leave me when I need you the most? Dad? Dad? Dad, why did you leave me? Abby thinks I've left her. And as much as it pains me to hear that, she's right. I've left her. The best that we can do is can we save the things? actual eyes so that cosmetically she doesn't lose them. That's my girl. I understand. That's my girl. That's my little girl. There's support groups, and I know this is a very difficult time. No! I've left her to realize she's more courageous than she ever imagined. I've left her to discover how beautiful she is from the inside out. I've left her to challenge herself in ways she never considered. I've left her to discover how strong she really is. me, baby. Why did you leave me? I was right here. I was always here. Where did you go? I was always here, baby. Listen, no one believes in you more than I do. You know that. Think about how far you've come. Don't you, baby? Yeah. Come here. My dad says he gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. You ready? Yep. Folks, what we are seeing here is amazing. This is a testament of true love. Love is allowing mother. someone to see their true worth and beauty. I used to think my dreams were over. I thought I'd never run again. And even though I can't see my dad, I know he's guiding me the entire way. It's okay, uh, I cried the first time, four times my team shows to me. I, I, wanna, I want you to think about this, this video. 
I want you to listen to the words of Job. Job is another one who went through something very similar that Joseph went through. Listen to what Job says in Job 23. He said, look, I go forward, but he, God, is not there. I'm backward, but I cannot perceive him. Now look at this. When he works, see her dad was working. She didn't perceive him. The whole time he's working, he's watching her. He's, she just didn't know he was there. He didn't want her to know she, he was there. And when he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows where I'm going. Why? Because he plans it. And when he tests me, can, can we stop a moment there? Why does everybody have such an issue with tests? Can I, can I answer that? It's called midterms and finals. <laughs> but can I say this? I flew over the Pacific Ocean a few weeks ago, and I am so glad the pilot passed the test because he and I didn't end up at the bottom of the ocean. Testing only shows you what's in you. God said to Israel, I brought you into this wilderness to humble you and test you so that you could know what's in your heart. He knew it was in their heart. They needed to know it was in their heart. I will come out as pure gold. Do you know gold in its pure state? Do you know it's actually tender? Do you know you can actually bend it? It's flexible. It's not inflexible. Do you know gold has a counterpart? It's called brass. Do you know brass? Brass tarnishes because of the atmosphere. Gold can never tarnish. Do you understand when you go through his refining, the world, the atmosphere of the world can't tarnish you anymore? <laughs> Pure gold is transparent. You can see right through it like glass. The streets of heaven are made out of it. Do you understand when you come out as pure gold, they don't see you anymore? They see the treasure in you? I think it's time that we see a whole lot more of Jesus in the church. You still with me? What was Job's response? The exact is, the exact is Joseph's. For I've stayed on God's path. I have followed his ways and I've not turned aside. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than my daily food. I, I don't understand how people are actually making it. And I think I do understand why so many are falling away from the faith right now. Job said, I treasured his words more than my daily food, yet most people get a meal once every Sunday. And if there's a conference, they binge eat for a couple days. But can I, can I, can I, can I, can I suggest something? Go four months and only eat on Sunday afternoons and eat a light meal. And tell me how you're doing at the end of four months. Now, here's what's really scary. Our physical body when we don't feed it, it screams, I'm hungry, <laughs> right? And it gets louder, right? Do you know your spirit does just the opposite? It gets quieter when we don't feed it. I'm not, I'm not against social media. I use it, okay? I, I believe in it. But I don't understand how some people can spend two hours on social media and they say, oh, oh I, I just don't have time to read the Bible. Who are you kidding? Only yourself. Do you know I've been saved 40 years? I, I turned 60 in a couple months, okay? I know, I know, don't say it. I don't look a day over 80. But <laughs> I, I, my favorite book to read is my Bible. I have all these colored pencils. My Bible's with me in my hotel room on my carry-on only luggage. I love reading the Bible, because I say, Holy Spirit, show me something I've never seen before about Jesus or your ways. I'm going to close it with this. I've never before told our team, get this book out and get this message out as fast as possible. Because I believe it's a prophetic message. When I got saved in 1979, the first six years of my Christian walk, I saw miracles that would literally blow this generation's minds. I literally would watch guys, and I'm the assistant to the pastor, so I know this isn't phony. I'm watching people walk in with red and white canes who cannot see at all, and they walk out seeing. I watch an ambulance pull up. Guys got 24 hours left to live. Paramedics wheel him down on a gurney with all the IVs on him, and the guy gets healed instantly and pushes the gurney out. We have a wall that has crutches, canes, and wheelchairs. 
the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan sitting in our service just on a typical Sunday night. My pastor's walking down the aisle, reads the guy's mail. He had a gun under his seat. He was going to kill himself that night if God wasn't real and didn't show himself. He got saved. I preached with him in prisons together. He and I preached together after he got saved. The guy's amazing. Jesus appeared in one of our services with two angels. 800 people saw him on, the, on, the, on that balcony. And when he disappeared, he left an imprint of his face on the wall, eight feet tall, six feet wide. And it stayed on the wall for a year and a half and gradually phased, away, phased out. I thought this is just Christianity, right? But God spoke to me in the middle of this. And he said this. I've given my church a thimble full of my power to see how she'll handle it. We didn't handle it well. To see if she'll market it, make money off of it, use it to draw attention to herself, use it to pull people to follow me. We didn't handle it well. So God said, I'm going to bring her into a wilderness. And we've been in that wilderness now for over 30 years. And God showed me we're about to come out in the next Next time period. I mean, it's not long. But then he showed me something. He said, the greatest attack against you comes at the very end of your wilderness. If you look at David, he's in the desert for 12 years. But it was the last couple days right before he's anointed king as Hebron is when the Amalekites stole everything of value of he and the 600 men, stole their wives, kidnapped their wives and children. And now the last 600 people on the earth that believed in David wanted to kill him but he didn't faint. If you look at Jesus, he goes into the wilderness filled with the spirit, but he comes out in the power. He's tempted by the devil for 40 days, but the real heavy temptations happen at the very end. The ones that were recorded in the Bible. The greatest attack against you comes against at the very end. And God showed me, he said, son, the sons of Issachar understood the times so they knew what Israel ought to do. The Bible tells us there is a purpose for every season. You know, I live in Colorado. I'm gonna close it with this. People come to Colorado, right? They love to ski. They get their snowboard, they get their skis, whatever they're doing, right? They got all their snow gear. They got their helmet, their goggles. They, right, they're so excited. They get on the chairlift. They go to the top of the mountain and they get off the chairlift and fall flat on their face. Why? Because it's summer. They did the wrong thing in the wrong season. What they should have had is a mountain bike. There is a purpose for every season. If you don't understand the purpose, you don't know what to do. And God showed me, he said, strengthen my people. Because I can't, you can't afford any of us to lose our harvest. We need you to not be like Moses' generation. We need to be like Joshua's generation because everyone completed their destiny in Joshua's just generation except one guy named Achan. That's what I'm believing for. Did you get something out of this tonight? Did you get something out of this tonight? I want every head bowed. I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed. I want every head bowed. Every eye. I'm talking to leaders tonight. But I need you to be honest and not fool yourself. I'm so glad you listened to my counseling appointment, but now can you apply it to you? Some of you in here, you're in the fire. And you've been complaining. Some of you have been a little passive aggressive with God. You're like, why should I obey? What good has it done me? Oh man, it was so beautifully spoken. I couldn't have thought of a better exhortation than Pastor Lee gave. I was in awe. Let me tell you, all the prodigal had to do is just have a change of heart and say, I've been so stupid, what I've been doing. And his father came running for him, bearing gifts. I'm not here to put shame on you at all. I'm here to get you out of the behavior is keeping you from your glory that he has created you for. If you say, John, I've been complaining, maybe it's in your heart. Some of you, it's with your mouth or some of you have gone to the point where you're passive aggressive and disobeying. I wanna give you a chance to repent. That beautiful word called repent. 
If that's you and you say, John, that's me. You've identified me in any of those three areas. I want you to just raise your hand up high right now. I just want you to be on. Wow, look at all the hands. Okay, if your hand's raised, only if your hand's raised, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. I've gone just a couple minutes over time, and I believe the Holy Spirit can do a work right there where you're standing. I don't need to bring you down. I want you to just close your eyes, and I want you to just put your hands up as a sign of absolute total surrender. If you could see the face of Jesus right now, you would not see a disgusted look. You would not see angry eyes. You would see the biggest smile, the most joyful eyes. He is so delighted with your humility and your faith. There's been reasons you've been complaining. There's been reasons that you've even disobeyed. But you realize tonight your response has been wrong. And you're admitting it. And he knows now the flood of blessing that will come. There's no shame. There's no guilt. No condemnation. That father came bringing gifts. That father was celebrating. That father, as Pastor Lee so beautifully said, said, let me walk you to the house. And let me show you all I have for you. That's what he's going to do with you tonight. Do you see his arms? I see him. Do you see Jesus' arms? Just close your eyes. Look at your heart. Look in your heart. His arms are wide open and he, he, he's ready to embrace. Embrace you. Not only does he have that smile, the joy in his eyes, but I see his arms out. Now I want you to say this to him from the depths of your heart. Dear Father in heaven, Say it out loud. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to me tonight. Through your servant, I realize that I have acted very unwisely. That I've sinned against you by complaining, even by disobeying. And for this, I'm so deeply sorry. I ask you to forgive me. And I ask that you would cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. For I've made the decision already to turn from this behavior. And I will be faithful to you no matter how long it takes for your personal promises to manifest in my life. I will stay faithful. I will stay on your course. I will hold fast to your word. Thank you for empowering me with your grace to walk a life that brings you glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Just keep your hands up. Put put them up one more time. One more time. That's the presence of God. Right there. There he is right there. There's his presence. Let's everybody stand. And just lift up your hands just for a moment here. Because he's here. I want you to just, I want you to whisper to him. Nothing fake, nothing religious. Just say something to him. That's it. There's his presence again. It's beautiful. There's no condemnation in that presence. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's nothing but pure love. Father, thank you so much. Thank him. And let's give him praise. Come on. Amen.